Hey guys, welcome back. Here we are for chapter nine. In chapter nine, it is really sort of a companion chapter to chapter four. I usually sort of teach them together. So if you're looking at this chapter truly independently, it's worth a look at least at the extinction parts in chapter four. Chapter nine, sustaining biodiversity. What we're really going to look at are extinctions, how do they affect us, and what can they do about it, uh, primarily for this chapter. We're going to kick right off with the core case study, where have all the honeybees gone? As we know, the honeybee population has been declining since really about 2006 where they've even given it a name, the colony collapse disorder. We have seen the European honeybee populations and colonies in really sharp decline. Now, this is obviously important because they play such a key role in pollination. Here in the United States, the European honeybees pollinate about 71% of the vegetable and fruit crops. We tend to think of them as going by flowers, but a lot of our vegetables, corn, etc., actually have blooms which need pollination. Now, commercial beekeepers actually truck hives out to certain farms. A lot of farmers literally rent the bee colonies. So a beekeeper brings the colonies out to this farmer's orange grove, out to this corn crop, out to somebody growing cucumbers, you name it, strawberries. So they rent this particular species of bee and they bring out. But we have been seeing about 30 to 40 percent of their stock go down. It's the colony collapse disorder, enough bees go and that entire colony that's in one of the little bee things collapses and is gone. They lose them. They've been losing 30-40% of their stock every season. It's an issue. It's a danger. Now we'll look at it a little later, but there's a lot of reasons for it. Whether it's some fungus, whether it's pesticides being used, other things that they're running into, but it is dangerous to rely this much on a single species. Biodiversity tends to wind up working better for everybody. When we rely too much on one species, then it can create a huge problem. But honeybee is one of these things that we are looking at and tracking and realize it's an issue. Now section 9.1, which we're hitting today, is really species extinction. Once again, a lot of overlap from chapter four, so here we go. Species right now are becoming extinct at least a thousand times faster than the historical rate, and it could be as much as 10,000 times faster than the historical rate. Once again, faster than this background extinction. And a lot of these are human-related causes, which we're gonna get into in this chapter. We're gonna look at habitat loss, climate change, and ocean acidification as some of these reasons. Now, extinctions are natural, but sometimes they increase very sharply. So it is a natural process. It's going on all the time. And we talk about the background rate. So the background rate of extinction, this is just what is happening, going on, normal for whatever reasons. The normal habitat, changes in climate, forest fires, uh, volcano erupts, disrupts an area, just happens, is about one species per million species. So for every million species out there on the planet at any given time, about one species go extinct a year. Now, we're unsure, but we think there are about 10 million species on the planet. So that'd be about 10 species going extinct a year. So if 10 species, 10, 12, 15, eight, that's just background, what we expect. When the rate rises above the background, that's where we kind of want to look around and go, hey, what's happening, what's going on? What we really believe we're in right now is a mass extinction event, because we are well beyond the background rate. 
So a mass extinction is extinction of many species in a short period of time. Now a short period of time can be thousands of years. You know, when we're looking at fossil record and several hundred million years ago and hey, we don't find any below this, it's not an overnight process. It's still hundreds if not thousands of years. But the past causes of mass extinction events have, where they're largely unknown. We feel pretty confident about one 65 million years ago was a large asteroid. Lots of data to back that up and evidence from it. But many of the others really are unknown. It can be multiple volcanoes, can be other asteroids, comet, changes in the climate, but something to cause them. They've normally, we believe, been caused by large global changes in the environmental conditions. You know, what's again, where the asteroid hit, throws up a dust cloud that blocks out a lot of the sun, so many plants die off. Once again, global change cools off, sun doesn't get through, disrupts the food chain, etc. But these mass extensions have always been due to environmental conditions, if you will. Now, currently, human population are destroying and degrading habitats at a rapid pace. Once again, think about going and creating a farm. We cut down the trees to turn it into a farm. We cut down the grasslands to turn it into a farm. We spray the pesticides to get the bugs away so that our farms can, you know, we're changing and degrading the habitat. So our huge resource consumption, just our lifestyles in general in the United States have a large ecological footprint. We want lots of things. These things have to be made, provided, harvested, etc. And because of that, our extinction rates have risen sharply very recently. Once again, our best estimates are the current extinction rate is some thousand times higher than the natural background rate. 100% would be 10 species. 200% would be 20 species a year, 300%, 30. You know, we think we're at more than a thousand times higher than the natural back rate. At least a hundred species a year, and it could be a lot more. This rate of extinction and threats to our ecosystem services are likely to rise very sharply in the next 50 to 100 years, your lifespan. Remember, ecosystem services, that are, those are all the things that nature is providing for us. Oxygen, clean water, basic food that we need, livelihood. Many of the things that we rely on are happening in nature out in the rural areas. Most of us live in urban areas, but we're dependent on the ecosystem services from the rural. So this is what we are worry about. The mass extinction may have an effect on our ecosystem services, the things we need for survival. Now, there's a lot of biodiversity hot spots out there, like the rainforest or a coral reef. They just tend to have really high biodiversity. And these are the places where extinction rates are projected to be much higher than average. We've seen our coral reefs get degraded from sometimes it's tourists going and being in them so much. A lot of it's been pollution and acidification of the oceans because of the fossil fuels we burn, creates higher levels of acid in the ocean. We know with the rainforest, we've been cutting them down so that we have croplands, etc. Biologically diverse environments are being eliminated entirely or highly fragmented. Remember, fragmentation is simply where we take a forest and we cut a swath through it. There's still forest here, and we have farmland or housing, and we have another little forest here. It used to be one big forest, well now it's fragmented and things can't get from here to over there, and it can cause problems. Now, we're estimating that our extinction rate is a thousand times above background noise, background extinction rate. But there are problems with estimating. Because natural extinction, this background rate, it's a long process. Once again, it doesn't happen overnight. Unless we know there's this one type of owl that only lives in this type of area and we cut all the trees down. 
but as a general rule, uh, species going extinct is a long process. You know, the numbers dwindle, they get lower, lower, and eventually none are left. So it's difficult to document. Our fossil record doesn't document everything. We don't have fossil record of every living thing. But when we see like these large animals that we can recognize, say like the tiger not around anymore, those we can see. So a lot of times we kind of focus on the ones that we can see and notice more clearly. So we've only identified about two of the seven to 10 million species on the planet Earth. And we know very little about the ecological roles of most of the identified species we have. We've talked about some of these keystone species like the American alligator or the otter. And many of these species, we don't really realize the ecological niche that they really occupy and how important it is until they're gone. Obviously with honeybees, we realize if there were no more honeybees, our pollination rates would sharply decrease. So some things we know, but many we don't. So our approach is to observe how reductions in a habitat area affect extinction rates and then estimate the current rates. So if we know if we eliminate the things in this area, what would happen, then we look at how much habitat we are actually removing and we begin making estimates. Because we know if we remove this habitat, what would happen? And then we look at habitats that are being removed and we have to begin to make some of our estimates. There's problems with it. It's not perfect, it might be a little high, it might be a little low, but we've gotten pretty good at these estimates. Now, let's talk about endangered species versus threatened species. Now, first off, any time that we see an endangered or, or we mark it endangered or threatened, this is an ecological smoke alarm. If this animal is going extinct, why? What's the problem? There's a problem with the ecosystem. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going extinct. So anytime we see the numbers of a particular animal, especially something we can see dwindling, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, it's a smoke alarm. Where there's smoke, there's fire. What's the problem? So, an endangered species. We label it endangered if there are so few members of that species that they could become soon extinct. And otherwise, if we don't do something, they probably will become extinct. A threatened species. There are still enough numbers or individuals to survive, but their numbers are declining. And if the numbers keep declining, then we would move them into endangered. There are simply more protections for an endangered animal than a threatened. But when an animal becomes threatened, we realize it could become endangered and we really start trying to watch and pay attention and do what we can before it makes the endangered species look. So just the difference between endangered, the biggest problem, threatened. Because after endangered, it's simply extinct. We can get things that are either regionally extinct or functionally extinct. Regionally extinct means it is extinct in areas that it's normally found. Let's take something like the tiger. It once used to roam a huge swath of lands. Now it's restricted to very small areas and a lot of times even preserves. Wild elephants, they used to roam most of Africa, but now you only find them in certain areas. So we could talk about them being regionally extinct. They used to be here, but they're not. The elk up in the Appalachians have become regionally extinct. Elk aren't extinct, but they are not found in the Appalachians anymore. They were hunted out of existence. Now they have brought in from Manitoba a new population of elk, which are thriving, but once again, they were driven to extinction regionally. We can also talk about something being functionally extinct. It's the point where the interaction with other species are lost or been greatly diminished. The white rhino is functionally extinct. The last male is gone. We have two females, but its time is almost gone. Now that's extreme functionally extinct. But when the numbers get so small, they're not gonna be able to make it in the wild. They're functionally extinct. 
We may still have them for a very short period, but we'll see. Now, let's look at some of these animals and why where they are coming extinct. So I'm gonna throw the picture up here and we'll take a look at them. There are a lot of different reasons why certain animals come on this endangered or threatened species list. There's certain reasons. The first one up there, the blue whale. Well, this represents blue whale, giant panda, rhinoceros, they all, all have this same feature. They are a K strategist. Once again, their reproductive style is low reproductive rate. They give only birth to a few organisms and they're very long spaced apart. They may not have, a, you know, they have one calf and then it's two, three years later before they have another. So since they have such a long, slow reproductive rate, if their numbers dwindle, they're in specific danger of extinction. The giant panda, it has such a specialized niche. When something has to survive only on one type of food or one particular area, well, if that thing becomes threatened, the animal becomes threatened. So things in a very specific niche are more likely to become on a threatened or endangered species. A narrow distribution, uh, like the elephant seal or the desert pupfish. We only find them in this little, little teeny tiny area. So if that habitat gets destroyed or threatened, they tend to go. Um, the things that feed at really high trophic levels, it shows a picture of an eagle, it could be eagle hawk, these tertiary consumers. Something that's eating plants, you're pretty safe. And then the thing that's eating the thing that eat the plants, but the higher you go up, so I have a primary consumer, an herbivore, I have a secondary consumer, so we have the grasshopper eating the grass, I have the bird eating the grasshopper, but when I have a bird eating the bird, uh, it's feeding at such a high tropic level that they become endangered. Things like eagles, tigers, bears, or such like these. Uh, it says it shows the sea turtle fixed migratory patterns where they always migrate in the same way if the climates change, a problem happens in the habitat, they become issues. Some things are just very rare, like the African violet. Now we can get them in homes, we grow them, but in the wild, they're incredibly rare. Those and some orchids as well. The ghost orchid in Florida, very rare, only happens in a little tiny area in some swamps. If they are commercially valuable, the rhinoceros. Rhinoceros largely went extinct because of cutting off its horn. Rhinoceros horn was used in a lot of homeopathic type things. It was seen as being a sign of strength or virulence to eat uh, rhino horn powder, etc. And then also things that just require very large territories, like our Florida panther, virtually ex it's functionally extinct. There's so few of them because they require such large territories. And as humans spread and we cut out where they can live, not many of them around anymore. So these guys are smoke alarms. Uh, this last one up here, we're just gonna look at a handful of large animals, if you will, that have very little left. The Mexican gray wolf. There's only about 114 of them left in the Arizona, New Mexico area. The California condor. Now, we have about 300 of them in the wild now, but back in 1986, there were only nine left. They were all captured, brought in, they did breeding techniques, and they've been releasing them back into the wild. They're up to 300, but still very, very few. The whooping crane in North America, we think there's only about 400 or so left, and also the Sumatran tiger. There's a lot of different tigers, Siberian tiger, Bengal tiger, Sumatran. So off the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, only about 400 of these left in the wild. A lot of these large animals we're gonna watch in our lifetime, if we're not very careful, go extinct. That is it for section one. Join me next time for section two when we look at why do we care? Take care, guys. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.